Cure International, we're a global network of eight pediatric hospitals celebrating 25 years of helping children with treatable disabilities, such as cleft lip and palate, club foot, bowed legs, burn contractures, spina bifida, brain tumors, and hydrocephalus. By establishing pediatric hospitals within countries where disability is often prevalent and overlooked, CURE can provide access to continuous care for children in need. CURE also focuses on spiritual care. From outreach to surgery to the last visit, our ministry is determined to share God's love with every patient and family that CURE meets because knowing God's love brings lasting comfort to those suffering. And because we're all about healing at CURE, we go beyond healing the children and their families by supporting the country as a whole. So children who don't have access to a CURE hospital can still receive world-class treatment where CURE-trained doctors carry on our mission. By partnering with community churches, national healthcare organizations, and local ministries of health, we help build and empower the healthcare systems of our host countries from the ground up. CURE is the children we treat, the communities we serve, the people we work alongside. And finally, CURE is you, our partners who make it all possible. In the years ahead, we aim to double the number of children we serve because the need is growing. So we have to do the same. That means more surgery, more spiritual care, and more healing for the most vulnerable. You've heard God's call to help heal children who are suffering. It's incredible what's accomplished when we work together under our mission of healing the sick and proclaiming the kingdom of God. Well, I'm excited to be here with all of you uh, this morning. My name is Sterling. If we haven't had the opportunity to meet yet, I am a, uh, our campus pastor at our Mill Creek campus. Um, and we were scheduled to have a ice cream truck over there uh, today. Luckily, it got rained out and postponed because I think it was intentional that Jeff scheduled me to be here this morning when we were going to have ice cream. So... Um, it is, it, it, Cure is an amazing ministry, you guys, and they're, they are doing such a good work, and we have the opportunity through Serve the World today to, um, to, be, to partner with that work, and um, one of the exciting things about this, and, and many of you may know this, is over the last two weeks of our VBS programming, our kids have been raising money for Cure, so as a church, as Serve the World this summer, we have a goal of raising $150,000. And our kids have started us on that process. And over two weeks of VBS, they have raised over $11,000 just coming in from our, I mean, it's amazing. It, and, and part of what I love about that story, right, is the way in which generosity, right, you're all generosity that helps us do the programming that Chapel Street holds here. We couldn't do that with your, without your support and participation has also spurred on in the lives of our kids, given them opportunities to be generous. And now we get to, uh, as adults, partner with them. And so over the course of the next four weeks, you're gonna hear more about Cure and Serve the World. Um, if you're not familiar with Serve the World, Serve the World is a giving initiative that we have here at Chapel Street, where we partner with uh, both local and global ministries that are making the gospel really tangible. Some really practical ways, and Cure is a perfect example of that. This $150,000 will help go to fund a surgeon for a year and to equip a surgical center. So just that goal that they stated of, of doubling their output, um, we, we can be a part of that. And so whether or not you can give $5 or $5,000 or beyond that, we would love to invite you to, to partner in this with us. Uh, maybe you're new to Chapel Street. Maybe you're new towards giving towards something like this. This is a great place to start. And we're excited to see all that God is gonna do in and in, in through this ministry. Um, and you can find out more information. You can give online. You can give here and, and uh, physically in the room as well. If you designate that check or those funds towards Serve the World, um, this is what it will go to serve. So thank you again uh, for being a part of that. This summer here at Chapel Street, we are studying together and looking at what it means to pursue wisdom. What does it mean to live wisely? 
And, and the primary way that we're doing that is we're studying this, what really served as this Old Testament manual for training young people, specifically in that culture. It was designed to train young men for service in the court, to be advisors, places where wisdom was going to be required of them. And, and how to think, how to approach life through the lens of wisdom, how to make wise decisions. And I think at one level or another, this, this resonates with us. We understand the need for this through a variety of different kind of experiences that we have, decisions we have to make. Just this Father's Day, uh, my wife, Sherry, wanted to surprise me. Unbeknownst to me, she had kind of over the course of time been setting aside some money, and she knows that I love grilling and that sort of thing. And so she so I was with our students in the Twin Cities. I got home right before Father's Day, and she said, I want, I want you to buy a smoker for Father's Day. Uh, I didn't argue with her about that. Um, I wanted to do that. And so she had kind of started to do some research, but she thought, like, I would kind of enjoy that process. So she said, like, gave me kind of a budget and said, Here, here's what we're looking for. And so I just, I dove in uh, all the way. Like I started reading every blog I could find. I, I read reviews. I went on YouTube and watched people talk about all the different options. I called friends and texted them and asked them what they had and what their experience was and was shopping around and going from store to store, looking at all the information, acquiring as much information as possible. In fact, at one point in time, my one of my daughters and my wife were leaving to go take the dogs on a walk and I heard kind of from the other room, my daughter say to Sherry, who said, I think there's a medium level probability that, that dad spends the rest of his life researching smokers and never actually buys one. <laughs> and when she came back from the walk and I was still on the couch doing the same thing, she, I heard her go, I think the probability has moved to high now. So, and of course, like you get that, right? Well, I, I wanted to be as prepared as possible to to make a decision that I was not going to later regret. And we can all relate to that at one level or another, but the stakes are relatively low when we're talking about something like a household appliance. But when we start thinking about the decisions that we make in regards to raising our kids or to navigating all different types of relationships, whether it's marriage or friendship or coworkers or neighbors, or even if we were to step back from all of that a little bit and just think more generally about a, a desire and effort to faithfully seek and live for the glory and honor of God. Like how do we become equipped to do that? What, what does wisdom look like in regards to those kinds of decisions? Perhaps put differently, what, what does it look like to be wise? And what does it look like to be foolish? In fact, that is that, that idea, that contrast, that's one of the primary methods that the book of Proverbs uses in order to help teach us what wisdom is. It's this idea of a contrast between being wise and, and being foolish. It describes and, and it defines what foolishness is in order to teach us to be wise. And from the very outset of this uh, conflicting approaches to life, wisdom versus foolishness, the way it's presented in, in, this, in the Proverbs is it's presented as a choice that we're going to need to make. We're either gonna operate and align ourselves with wisdom or we will operate and align ourselves with foolishness. In fact, in Proverbs, in the introduction, chapters one through nine, where, where we kind of get this big kind of picture of the nature of wisdom, Solomon uses a, a common tool in ancient Near East wisdom literature. He writes it as if a father is writing to his son. And at the end of this introduction, chapters eight and nine primarily, he personifies both wisdom and foolishness as, as two potential spouses that the son is going to new, uh, need to choose between. That either he is going to align himself, attach himself to wisdom, or he's gonna align himself and attach himself to foolishness. And so in the time that we have together today, I wanna just, 
I want to spend some time just taking uh, in a couple of these observations, a couple of the ways that Scripture compares and contrasts wisdom and foolishness. And to help form in our own thinking, what does it mean for us to choose wisdom, to align ourselves with wisdom? So if you have your Bibles with you, let's turn to uh, Proverbs chapter 8. This is uh, that section that I was just describing where uh, wisdom is being personified. And in this portion of scripture, wisdom is actually speaking. She's the one describing um, being there at the very formation, creation of the world. So this is Proverbs 8, beginning in verse 22. It says, this is wisdom speaking. And she says, the Lord acquired me at the beginning of his creation, before his works of long ago. I was formed before ancient times from the beginning, before the earth began. I was born when there were no watery depths and no springs filled with water. Before the mountains were established, prior to the hills, I was given birth. Before he made the land, the fields, or the, the, fields or the first soil on earth, I was there when he established the heavens, when he laid out the horizon on the surface of the ocean, when he placed the skies above. When the mountains of the ocean gushed out, when he set a limit for the sea so that the waters could not violate his command, when he laid out the foundations of the earth, I was a skilled craftsman beside him. I was his delight every day, always rejoicing before him. I was rejoicing in his inhabited world and delighting in the children of Adam. So here we have this personification of wisdom and the principle, the contrast that Proverbs begins to set up between wisdom and foolishness is simply this, is that wisdom will align itself with God's created order and foolishness attempts to create its own. Wisdom will align itself with the design, the order of God's created world where, where foolishness in an effort to kind of hold its own control will seek to define it for itself. Doug Ressler, in an article that he wrote on pursuing wisdom, says it this way. He says, wisdom is when we see the truth and adjust our lives accordingly. Foolishness, on the other hand, is when we demand that truth adjusts to our reality. I, um, we, we learn these realities, right, about order and design sometimes. And, and when we conflict with design and order in something, oftentimes it comes with consequences. I, I learned that again afresh this week in somewhat of a, a painful way. I, uh, I was working on, on one of our cars, Sherry's car, and, and was doing a project that I felt comfortable with. I was changing the, the front brakes and rotors. And, and yet while I was doing this, it's like one of those things where it's like while I'm here kind of thing. And I had ordered some other parts and, and I was like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do this uh, pulley that was making noise. I wanted to replace it. Anyways, I dove into something where it was late in the day. Okay, so I was already tired. That was, that was mistake number one. Um, and I started to take apart this part, and as I was doing so, the bolt that I was removing was so long that it just backed out against the frame of the car. Like, it, you could not get it all the way out. So my assumption was that somebody had, other than me, had made a mistake, right? So I, I took a Sawzall, and I just cut the, I know, I, I, this is a mistake number two, at least. I, I cut the bolt in, in half. Um, and if you've ever worked on cars before, like oftentimes the nuts and bolts, it's not like you just run over to Ace Hardware and, and pick this thing up, okay? So after I've done this, I realized that there was a second bolt, and had I not just cut that bolt, you just had to remove this second one, the whole mechanism drops out and everything would have come out. But instead, I spent two hours driving to a Honda dealer that was like what felt like a million miles away to get this one singular bolt. I had parked our car like where it was half in the garage and half out. So there was no option of like, I'll wrap this up tomorrow kind of thing. And the next thing you know, it's midnight. I'm, I'm under the car and I, I'm not happy as you might imagine. All because I didn't, I didn't recognize that the good people of Honda had a way of designing this. 
of ordering this. I, I ignored it altogether and it came with consequences. See, why does Solomon describe wisdom as present at creation? Why is she there? Because wisdom operates in accordance with God's order and design. The wise, it's saying, will acknowledge this. They'll align themselves to this design and foolishness in contrast to that will ignore it. Right, we, we understand this perhaps most intuitively just it comes to like physical order. We, there's a phrase, a saying, right? Like don't, don't spit into the wind. Like the physical realities. When, when I was a Moody student one time, uh, one of our, my friends like had a, a pepper spray thing and decided kind of on a whim just to like press the button and it was right into the wind and blew it right back into all of us, right? Like that was, that was a bad day if you've ever been pepper sprayed before because you ignored just the physical realities and as much as those are important to understand, it's equally true of the moral and spiritual order of God's created design. For example, God created us you and I, to relate to each other in truth. Ultimately, because he is truth, because he, he personally relates to us in truth, and because he designed us to bear his image. So when, when we lie to each other, or when we begin to believe lies from each other, the inevitable result of that is, is going to be relational consequence. There's going to be damage that's done because we're not operating according to our design. There's broken trust that begins to, to be formed. And then on top of that, right, if, if I begin to lie so frequently or I'm holding on to a lie so tightly, my own capacity, my own ability to recognize and to acknowledge truth and to discern a lie as opposed to truth, becomes limited. It becomes hampered or damaged. Right? Wisdom is saying here, I was there when God formed the earth. When he established the boundaries, I know the way God designed you to work and to live, to be in relationship, to experience his love. I know how it's intended to function. And so the invitation of wisdom is align yourself to me. Because in doing so, you are aligning yourself to God's ultimate design and order. There's another aspect of, of this, this reality, this contrast, that I think we need to acknowledge in this conversation. If you, if you are anything like me, one of the frustrations that you may feel when you're studying Proverbs is that you want these statements that are made to come with guaranteed outcomes like guaranteed results. But as we've talked about before, Proverbs are principles, they're not promises. You see, one of the other realities that wisdom will acknowledge, while there is an order and there is a design in creation, it also recognizes that we live in a broken world, that there is fallenness that we experience all around us. So even in our own efforts and attempt, I'll be them imperfect and incomplete, to live according to wisdom, we can still experience the brokenness and the pain of, of a fallen world. Now, this was the, the issue that, that Job ran into in the counsel from his friends. The assumption that they were making, if you remember this story, when Job is in the midst of just dire suffering and loss, the conclusion that they come to is that there has to be some unconfessed sin in your life, Job, or otherwise, right? You would not be experiencing these things. They, they, they want to acknowledge order and design, but fail to acknowledge fallenness and brokenness in the world. But we have the benefit when we read Job of having this kind of greater perspective and seeing all that is unfolding, but the friends don't recognize that. They fail to acknowledge that. And so the wisdom they apply to him actually becomes foolishness. Despite all of this, right, wisdom invites us and encourages us to align our lives with him. While we will still experience brokenness in this world, wisdom says don't make it self-inflicted. Don't make it that of your own doing. 
Which brings us then to this, this second contrast, the second principle that, that we see between wisdom and foolishness. And that is simply this, that wisdom receives correction and foolishness rejects it. Wisdom receives correction while foolishness has a tendency to reject it. In fact, this idea is all over Proverbs. Let me just give you a, a few examples. Proverbs chapter 12, verse 1. Whoever loves discipline loves knowledge, but the one who hates correction is stupid. Like, I wasn't even allowed to say that word when I was a kid. Like, but Proverbs goes right after it, right? Chapter 15, verse 5, the fool despises his father's discipline, but a person who accepts correction is sensible. Proverbs 19, verse 20, listen to counsel and receive instruction so that you may be wise later in life. And you will find statements like this. You'll find this comparison and contrast between the wise and the fool all throughout Proverbs. And notice right away that when we consider these verses and we think about this contrast, one of the principles, one of the realities that emerges here is that wisdom is something that needs to be acquired, that it's something that needs to be learned, gained. This summer, uh, my family will we'll head to the beach like we have for the same beach in South Carolina that we've been going to for almost 40 years. And when my kids were little, when they were babies, right, and you take them to the beach and they're playing in the, the little wake and, and, and getting wet and splashing and all that, and I love that stage of life, but inevitably, my daughters, I think I have a picture of all three of them where they had grabbed a handful of sand when they were like one years old and just decided to plop it in their mouth. And when you think, is that, we would look at that and be like, not a wise decision on their part, right? But we can also recognize and acknowledge that that decision was, it comes from, it emanates from a lack of experience, a lack of knowledge, something that they need to be taught. If I were to go there with my now adultish age children, right, and they were to do the same thing, we, it would be a completely different issue, right? In fact, this is, this is one of the things that Proverbs actually sets up for us as, it, as we think about the angles or, or the nature of foolishness. Flip back to Proverbs chapter one, verse 22. He says, how long inexperienced ones will you love ignorance? So that's that first kind of, of foolishness, right? It's a, it's a lack of knowledge, a lack of understanding, but then it goes on. And how long will you mockers enjoy mocking and you fools hate knowledge? The first is a lack of experience. It's an immaturity. They simply don't know better and they need to be taught. But the foolishness is not only an issue of age or maturity or knowledge. But there is a type of foolishness. And, and again, we can, we, we know and we have at times been ourselves, right, operating out of a very experienced, very knowledgeable foolishness of our own. And that's what it talks about as, as mockers. This kind of foolishness, this is actually not rooted in a lack of knowledge. It's rooted in pride. It's that, that sense of unwillingness, a stubbornness to admit that we're wrong. An unwillingness or a stubbornness to receive correction. So while the first kind of foolishness, what they need is to be taught. The second kind of foolishness, what they need is to be humbled. One of the correctives that Proverbs gives us is this extend, uh, extends this invitation that invites us to, to be corrected. But we will only accept that invitation if we are willing to recognize our own need for correction. I think one of the indicators, one of the hallmarks that, that I am operating out of kind of this second type of foolishness, the, the one that's born out of my own stubbornness and obstinance, is, is when somebody brings or I'm confronted with some kind of correction and my immediate knee-jerk reaction to that is defensiveness. Right? Or if, I, if, if my response to that is I immediately began to create 
excuses, if I begin to talk about why that's not what's really going on, if, if correction comes and I'm incapable of receiving or accepting responsibility, right, then it's, it's to me, it's an awareness and understanding that I'm kind of landing in that, that second place where I've dug in my heels and I'm going to do things my way. There isn't only a, a, a foolishness that comes from a lack of information. There's a foolishness that comes from a condition of our heart. Wisdom listens. Foolishness ignores. The hard thing here, and, and I would venture to guess that many of us have, can relate to this, is oftentimes this, this second kind of foolishness, oftentimes it masquerades as wisdom. How do we understand what we're operating out of? And if you turn over to James chapter three, James is another book of the Bible that has a strong emphasis on, on our need for and the value of wisdom. And so, in fact, sometimes people will refer it to it as the, the wisdom literature of the New Testament. It's a theme that it addresses frequently. And, and this is what James writes. This is chapter three, verse 13. Who among you is wise and understanding? By his good character, he should show that his works are done in gentleness that comes from wisdom. But if you have bitter envy and selfish ambition in your heart, don't boast and deny the truth. Such wisdom does not come down from above, but is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. For where there is envy and selfish ambition, there's disorder and every evil practice. But look at verse 17. But the wisdom from above is fierce, first pure, then peace-loving, gentle, compliant, full of mercy and good fruits, unwavering, without pretense, he writes. So one of, one of the litmus tests that we, that we can apply to our thinking, that we can that we apply to our approach to life is to ask ourselves, where is this leading? What is this producing? Is the likely outcome of this to lead towards that which is pure and, and peace-loving, gentle and compliant? Is it full of mercy and good fruit, unwavering and, and without pretense? Right? It's saying that if, if we apply, if we align ourselves with God's order and design, if that's what we're operating out of, what should result from that, as far as it relates to us, are these kinds of things. Wisdom aligned with God's created his design. If not, if it's not producing these kinds of things, then the question that we have to ask ourselves is, am I willing to be corrected? Am I willing to be confronted or will I continue or remain in foolishness? Which leads us then to, to the third contrast that I wanna, I wanna highlight today and that is simply that wisdom stands and foolishness falls. Wisdom stands and foolishness falls. If you've been around Chapel Street for any length of time, you'll know that, that one of the things that we try to do when we're looking at a text together and thinking about how it applies is is we'll try to find a way to use story to help kind of drive a, a truth of scripture home, right? So we'll, we'll talk about order and design and the consequences of cutting a bolt in half when you fail to recognize that, right? We'll, we'll try to find some way to make these things memorable. And what's fascinating is that when you look at the teachings of Jesus in the New Testament, this was a tool that he would frequently use with his disciples is that he would teach them something and then he would, would help them kind of receive it by giving them, sometimes it would be a parable, other times it would just be more or less an illustration. In the Gospel of Matthew, in, in chapters five through seven, we have this collection of the teachings of Jesus in which Jesus is telling his disciples, these are, these are the ways in which my kingdom operates. And if you're familiar with this, it's frequently called the Sermon on the Mount, right? If you're familiar with the Sermon on the Mount, you know that what Jesus does there in so many ways feels counterintuitive to our own understanding of how the world works. 
In fact, you'll, he begins, and he begins in, in chapter five to describe those who are blessed. And if we just kind of think for a moment about our own definition and understanding of blessing, right? And see if this is what it sounds like to you. He says, blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are the humble. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Blessed are the merciful, the pure in heart, the peacemakers. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness. And he goes on like this. And he begins to take our, our understanding of what it means to be blessed. And he, he completely flips it on itself. And he goes on from there, he says, if somebody, if somebody were to strike you on one side of the face, you should turn to them the other. This is his way and his kingdom, right? And he says, if, if somebody's persecuting you, if you have an enemy, you should pray for them. That's typical standard wisdom, right? He goes, lay down your worry time and time and time again. Jesus reorients us around his vision and his kingdom. And at the conclusion of this teaching, after he's given this expansive understanding of the kingdom of God, he tells a story. He, he concludes his sermon with a final illustration. And some of you will be familiar with this, but this is at the end of Matthew chapter seven. After he's taught his disciples this, this way of living, he says, therefore, chapter seven, verse 24, he says, therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain fell, the rivers rose, the winds blew and pounded that house. Yet it didn't collapse because its foundation was on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and doesn't act on them is like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rains fell, the rivers rose, the winds blew and pounded that house and it collapsed. It collapsed with a great crash. Sort of summing all that up in just a few chapters later, Jesus would say to his disciples, whoever wants to save his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Jesus says that the wise will build their lives on his words, on, on his description of his kingdom. Because, and this is important, his entire point is like, this is what endures. This is what is solid. This is what's rooted in eternity because he is the source. He is the foundation, he says, on which you can build your life. And let's be honest with each other for a moment. On sheer face value, from a strictly human perspective, oftentimes the vision that Jesus teaches us looks absurd. Oftentimes to us, it looks like foolishness. But his point is that this is the creator teaching us the manner in which the world is designed to work. And of course, there is no greater example of this than the cross. What appeared from a sheer human, worldly wisdom perspective to be utter defeat, and complete humiliation would be entirely flipped on its head so that Jesus was not the one who defeated, but sin and shame and guilt, that was defeated. Death lost, right? And the humiliation that he experienced on the, humi on the cross, that humiliation would be towards his ultimate glorification. Like those are what Lost. Those are what was defeated. And as Paul writes in 1 Corinthians, when he talks about how the world thinks and operates, the standard that it applies, he says, the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. I think Paul would say it like this. He would either say, we're going to live as a fool one way or another. We're either going to live as a fool towards God or we will live as a fool for God. And to live as a fool for God, that is actually the invitation of, of wisdom. That's what Proverbs is leading us to, live according to our design. And so this morning, as we conclude, I'm going to pray for us, and then we will come to the Lord's table together. And we will remind ourselves that it would be, from a, a worldly perspective, human wisdom, it would be great defeat that would ultimately lead towards ultimate victory.
that it would be through humiliation that we would understand salvation. So I'll invite the worship team to come up. Let's pray together, and then I'll lead us in, in the taking of the elements. Father, we do just thank you for this time together. We thank you for the opportunity to be reminded of, of what it means to be wise, Lord. And I just wanna I, I confess that oftentimes I am operating out a, a stubbornness of pride that wants to do things my way. But Jesus, teach me to adhere to your words, to the things that endure. And Lord, I pray that you would meet us in that as we come to the Lord's table today, that you would meet us in the bread and that you would meet us in the cup and that you would be reminded that it would be through your ultimate sacrifice that we would gain victory and salvation in you. And we ask these things in the name of Jesus, amen. You should have received as you came in this morning uh, the communion elements. And on the narrow side of the cup, you'll discover the bread. And if you peel that back, I invite you to take the bread this morning and to be reminded of the body of Christ. When Jesus was with his disciples, he took bread and he broke it and he said, this is my body given for you. Take and eat in remembrance of him. And then he took the cup and he said, this cup is my blood. It's been shed for the forgiveness of sins. This is the blood of a new covenant shed for you. Take and drink in remembrance of him. Amen. Amen. Before I offer this morning's benediction, if we can pray with you, just know that it's an honor and a privilege to do that. Our prayer team is available in the glass room. You'll find out there in the lobby. If you came prepared to give this morning, just know that your generosity matters so much, whether that's here to our general fund or if you would like to give to our Serve the World project. You can do that online, um, but we also have our generosity boxes by our doors as, as you exit. And now receive this morning's benediction. Go in the name of Jesus Christ, who to our world looks like a fool, but to us is our salvation. May we be found in him. And it's in his name we pray. Amen.